So thank you very much for inviting me every month. I feel it my honor and privilege to be doing the Lord's work, especially among bright youngsters. You know, what excites me, I'll tell you, from the bottom of my heart. You guys have 100 other things you can do. On a Saturday evening, you can watch a Netflix. You can go for with chilling out with friends. You can watch TV. You can do all kinds of things. But you took time to be with the Lord. That makes a huge difference for me. For a 60-year-old retired person to come and sit is easy because they would have much, nothing much to do. But you guys have so many things to do and you've taken time off. The Lord is watching this. He would definitely honor in his time. Right. Uh, these are very special days. As we know, we're coming to the end of the Lent meditation. And uh, yesterday, many of us celebrated. I'd like to use the word celebrate. Of course, it was the Lord going through pain and suffering. But it is a celebration for all of us because of that pain, because of that death, because of the torment and persecution, he gave us eternal life. So for us, it's a celebration of freedom, a celebration of salvation, a celebration of eternal life, a celebration into the inheritance of his kingdom, so on and so forth. I had the privilege of ministering his word, and I thought I should share some insights on a meditation on the cross, because normally what happens, we tend to speak about the cross one day of a year, which is Good Friday. But I think the meditation of the cross, the significance of the cross should be right in front of us every single day. Today, if you and I, you know, we sing the song tomorrow, you know, I, I am alive today because of Christ. And that is because of Christ's awesome sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. So for our meditation this evening, I have a passage from the New Testament. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. And I'm reading, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Now, when Paul makes this absolutely amazing statement in the book of Galatians, remember, Paul was an iconoclast. An iconoclast is a person who breaks religious symbols. He's a person who breaks churches, who, who tortures and torments Christian believers. That is Paul's old life. But he had an amazing encounter on the road to Damascus when the Lord Jesus Christ met him in person and said, why are you persecuting me? Why are you troubling me, Paul? And then Paul completely takes a 360 degree turn. He goes on to become the most vocal, the most powerful apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and is also attributed to writing the largest number of words about Jesus Christ. And one of those words is what we just read. He speaks about the glory. He says, but God forbid that I should glory. And Paul had every right to be, uh, to go, to boast. So when he talks about glory, <clears throat> the common translation is boasting. Things that I can be proud of. Paul came from a very high profile Benjaminite tribal family. So he belonged to the tribe of Benjamin. He was 100% Hebrew, 100% Jew, 100% Israelite. He had all the dictums and all the law built into him, into his biological, sociological, and legal system. He was taught by none other than the great philosopher Gamaliel. And Gamaliel, for the context, is likened to people like Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, all the big you know, philosophers. And in that line, we also keep Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was Paul's professor, Paul's teacher. So he learned from the best of the best. He came from the best of the best families. He came with law embedded into a system. And I say law, Jewish traditions, Jewish law, and Jewish legality, legalism. And then he completely takes, you know, a roundabout 360 turn and says, I have nothing to boast about. And he says, if I have to, I would boast about the cross and be crucified with Christ. Now, here's a very interesting thing about the cross, you know, the cross as a symbol has always been there in history, the cross as a symbol of punishment, the cross as a symbol of criminal persecution, the cross as a symbol of vile and negativity. And even before the Romans brought the cross as a symbol of punishment, the cross as a symbol has been there even before. We may not know this. But it's been there even in ancient Indian times, in Indian history, even in ancient Chinese history. We have had, you know, instances of the cross. 
but never did the cross take significance before Christ Jesus was laid there, barren and crucified. Till then, it was just a cross of shame. It was a cross of negativity. It was a cross of punishment. It was a cross of vile and it was a cross of <clears throat> persecution. Excuse me. But the moment the sinless God Almighty who got manifested in flesh came and was crucified on the cross, the cross took a completely different dramatic turn. Today, it is a symbol, the proud symbol of every Christian across the world to wear the cross with all pride and with all humility because that symbolizes that Christ died for us, rose again on the third day and gave us an entry into the forbidden heaven or forbidden eternity. So this is the background behind it. And to talk about Christ's sufferings, Christ's persecution, Christ's awesome sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, it was predetermined. It was predestined by God Almighty, God the Father, Yahweh, even before, many thousands of years before Christ could manifest into humanity as a human being. So there are actually 28 prophecies about Christ's birth, about his crucifixion, about the sufferings on the cross, many allusions in the Old Testament. And there are entire chapters of the Old Testament which are attributed to Christ's sufferings on the cross, the crucifixion. Most specifically, Genesis chapter 22, Psalm 22, we call the messianic you know, passages, messianic chapters, Isaiah 53 and Leviticus 16. These are whole chapters dedicated to the messianic call of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion and sufferings on the cross for all of mankind. God Almighty in his infinite wisdom could have done it in a much more simpler manner, but he wanted mankind to appreciate the sufferings that he would have to undergo in order that man can have eternal life, that man can have good health, that man can have deliverance from bondages and curses, that man can have deliverance from all kinds of curses and all kinds of sickness. And that's what is articulated in the seven beautiful words that Christ articulated when he spoke on the cross while he was going through those six hours of pain, torture, and torment. You know, in the world, we can have a lot of things that we can gloat about, we can honor about, we can say, you know, look at my wealth, look at the titles, look at the money, look at the property, look at the, uh, you know, the engagements that I have with society, look at the network that I have, look at all these things that I have, you know, I'm famous about, glory about all these things. But the glory of the cross, when it comes across, everything else fails into insignificance, because what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary is immeasurable. You know, there's a beautiful historical anecdote in the death of Alexander. When Alexander the Great died, he was put in a coffin and uh, he had, you know, both his hands, his right and left hand, were put outside the box, okay, with a hole made on both the sides and his hands were kept outside. And what Alexander wanted to send out to the world was that when I came into this world, I came with nothing. And when I went out of this world, I went out with nothing. But I want you to compare this with the two hands that Christ allowed, you know, long nails, painful nails to pierce his hands and he kept it outstretched. There are some amazing, significant, you know, revelations that come from that outstretched hand. Number one, he came with nothing, but he came for everyone. He came for the entire world. He did not come for the Jews. The Jews thought that he came as the king of the Jews because that's what they've been prophesied and that's what they've been expecting. But he came for everybody. So when Christ died on the cross of Calvary, he died for the Greeks, the Romans, the Gentiles, the Israelites, the Temelians, the Sri Lankans, the Emiratis, everybody on this planet. He died for each one of us. So when he kept his hands that way, it was holding the entire world and saying that I'm there for everybody, right? And when he went, he carried, he had the burden of carrying everybody's sins to the mercy seat of the Lord and asking for forgiveness, giving himself as the ultimate sacrifice. So when Alexander's empty hands depicted nothing, Christ's outstretched arms depicted everything. He bore everything for us, all our sicknesses, all our curses, all our bondages, all our iniquities, all the things that distanced us 
from God Almighty, Christ opened that, broke all the shackles, and gave us an entry into the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat, as we call it. That's why when Christ uh, let his last breath out of this world on the cross, the history says that the curtain of the holy temple was torn into two, which meant significantly that all of us as Gentiles had the ability, the power, and the blessing to reach out to his mercy seat without the intervention or the mediator of the high priest. So this was the biggest blessing that he gave us. So as I said earlier, the cross as a symbol of murder, as a symbol of punishment, as a symbol of torture, as a symbol of negativity was transformed into a symbol of liberation, into a symbol of resurrection, into a symbol of redemption, into a symbol of salvation, into a symbol of eternity and eternal life. And that is the biggest blessing that Christ Almighty gave us when he suffered on the cross. To give another medical context to the sufferings that Christ went through, we all know that he suffered five wounds. And we also liken that to the five you know, parts of the world or the five continents, though there are six. But the five wounds, if you have to look at it from a medical perspective, are concussion. You know what is concussion? Concussion happens when your head is shattered, when your head is hit with heavy equipments and it actually gets shattered, where everything inside the head gets completely uh, you know, mashed up. That's a concussion. They say you had a head concussion. Okay, when you meet with a deadly accident, they say concussion. So the first thing that Christ suffered was concussion on the head through the blazing of the wreath, the, you know, the wreath of uh, thorns, and of course, by being hit with heavy equipments. Then he also suffered what we call lacerations. Lacer lacerations for the technical uh, description are tearing of the skin, tearing of the flesh. How did that happen when they used wild stripes, you know, leather stripes to hit him on his back and hit him on his body. And when they hit it, each time they hit him, a portion of his flesh, a portion of his skin actually tore off. That is the kind of suffering that he had. So from concussion, he had lacerations as well. And then he had penetration. They penetrated nails and they penetrated swords and spears into his body, making holes of, into his body. So not only did blood seep out of his body, but also water and every other liquid that held his biological body. Concussion, laceration, penetration. There was also perforation when his nails, when his hands and legs were, you know, struck on the cross and it was nailed on him. These were long, you know, sharp nails which were nailed onto him. His hands were perforated and his legs were perforated and his knees were perforated. The last one, was incision, that is cuts that were made with very sharp objects like spears. And that's when the last one, when the Roman soldier put a spear inside his waist, you know, blood and water just gushed out of his waist. In other words, every single part of his body was tortured and tarnished for our iniquities and our sins. You know, if I were to ask you a question, who, who was responsible for the torture for this kind of a suffering that Christ went through, what would be your answer? Would you like to attempt an answer? Those of you here, would you like to attempt an answer? You can put your answers in the chat. Who killed Christ or who was responsible for Christ's sufferings? Okay, Albi says the Jews. Thank you, Albi. Anybody else who'd like to answer that question? Albi says Jews. Anybody else? Thank you very much. That was a very quick answer. Anybody else? Please quickly give me some more answers. Okay. Oh, beautiful. Nifi says, uh, okay, beautiful, beautiful. I'm getting some amazing answers. I'm going to read first um, from uh, uh, Nifi says it's Judas. Okay. And then there are a lot of you who said something amazing. Okay. Z50. I don't know who is Z50. We killed him. Amen to that. Andrew said us. Nirmitra says us. Getsy says us, Persis says we, Joel says our sins, Chris says we, and Preeti says people, humans, okay, all of us. So thank you very much, guys. We are the ones who crucified Christ, all of us. 
all of us, entire humanity. That's why the Bible says everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us, all our iniquities. You know, there's a beautiful passage in uh, Isaiah chapter 15, which says, and I want you to turn with me to Isaiah 59 verses one and two. You know, one is a very interesting promise, actually, but you should read two as well. And then you realize, you know, what God is trying to tell us. Isaiah um, 59 verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. We normally stop at that. But here's the real truth. And this is so important in the context of what we're discussing now. But, but, I don't want to say your, I, I'm, I'm not a prophet. So I'm going to say our iniquities have separated us from our God and our sins have hid his face from us that he will not hear. You got it? We were responsible for the separation between God and Christ, between God and holiness, between God and humanity. So when Christ came and died, there were some remarkable things that happened. Here's my next quiz question. What was the breadth of the cross? What was the size of the breadth of the cross? So since you guys are answering, I'd love you to answer this question on the chat. And related to that question, the length of the cross and the height of the cross. So breadth, length, and height. Give me three answers. Go ahead. Okay. Six feet. Andrew says six feet. Good. Okay. Anybody else? Six feet is what, Andrew? Is it breadth, length, height? I said three things. Okay. Andrew says it's the length. Okay. Interesting. Anybody else? Do I have only one answer? Others are saying this could be a trick question. I have to be careful. Okay, 10 feet. Okay, Chris Jason says it's 10 feet. Height is 10 feet. Okay, anybody else? Others are playing it safe. Okay, no idea. I like that. <laughs> okay, no idea. Lovely. Okay, length is 5.5 feet, Chris Jason says. Lovely. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Okay, height is eight feet, Joel says. Okay, I'll wait for another couple more seconds. Okay, height is eight feet. Interesting. Okay, here's my answer. Okay, Preeti says it's high enough to be seen. Okay, lovely. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, here's my answer. His breath, okay, his outstretched arm. That's the breath. I gave you the answer earlier. His breath is all the countries all the nations, all the tribes, all the languages, you add everybody, right from the people in Manhattan to Sharjah to Dubai to uh, the tribes and the jungles in Africa and everywhere. Everybody on this planet, seven point, I think, five billion people, that's the breadth of his cross. Okay? You want to know the height? The height is from, from earth to heaven. The height is from earth to heaven because that was the bridge. That was the gap that was there because of what Adam and Eve did on the Garden of Eden. They created this huge void and heaven and earth had this huge you know, distance and Christ by his cross connected the height of heaven with the depth of the earth. So what is the length? The length is the dimension of time from eternity to eternity. He has no beginning. He has no end. And his length is from eternity to eternity. Okay? So the next time somebody asks you this trick question, this is your answer. The breadth is the entire community of humanity, 7.5 billion and still counting. The height is the height between heaven and earth. And the length is from eternity to eternity. Never forget this. And this is the awesome sacrifice that our Lord did for us on that cross of Calvary. And while he was suffering those, uh, you know, six painful hours, torturous hours, he made seven profound statements. I'm going to spend a few minutes on each of those statements and then give you the essence of the cross in the next few minutes.
the first word or the first sentence that he uttered was, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, this is a very painful human cry. And we all know this particular verse is also quoted in Psalm 22. So he was actually quoting that particular scripture. Now, many of us get confused the first time when we hear that word, we say, why is God Almighty saying this particular thing? And the thing is that uh, he was saying that in his role as a hundred percent human. At that point of time, when he was laid on the cross, what, was, what has happened was that he was bearing the sins, the iniquities, the curses, the sicknesses, everything that was negative about mankind on him. And God, the Almighty, the Father Almighty, being the Holy One, cannot see unholiness. So he had to hide his face for a few seconds, for a few minutes, God knows. And as a result, Christ, the Son of God Almighty, had to be forsaken for a few seconds so that those sins can be born because of us, because of our iniquities. He had to bear that. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right? And the second one, he said, is I thirst. Now, I thirst has two connotations. One is the biological connotation, which is as human beings, we thirst. And we also know this, that you can survive without water for more than 72 hours. I mean, you can survive without food for more than 72 hours, but you can't survive without water for more than 24 hours. We would dehydrate, we would start dying. So water becomes an essential human element. That's why we call water the essence of life. So when he said, I thirst, he was in his human form, he was thirsty. But I don't know how many of you know this, when he was given that, uh, uh, you know, that bitter uh, liquid to drink, he refused. He didn't drink it. He actually didn't drink it. So even though he said, I thirst, he didn't actually drink it. But when he said thirst, he also thirsted for the redemption of humanity. He was thirsting for the souls to accept the gospel of grace, the accept the gospel of love, the gospel of forgiveness. And that's what he, what he meant when he said, I thirst. The third thing was, again, amazing. And I'm going to spend more time discussing that. He said, you know, throughout the six hours of his torture and persecution and on the cross of Calvary, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, this is, first of all, impossible from a human perspective, very difficult, because even us, when we go through bitter challenges, when we, you know, go through some real, you know, negative stuff done by somebody, we, it's very difficult for us to forget and forgive or forgive and forget, whichever order you want to call it. But here is Christ Jesus, who is tormented, who is torn apart, who is spat upon, whose beard is being pulled down, who's, so many things are happening. And around all that, he still says, Father, forgive them. That's a height of love, height of compassion, height of forgiveness, height of divinity. That's the only way you can describe that. And today, historians and traditional writers of those times say, that during the entire six hours of persecution and torture, they say, if there was one common message he was sending to Father Almighty, it was, Father, forgive them. So when he was spat upon, he said, Father, forgive them. When his beard was pulled, when the hair of his beard was pulled upon, he said, Father, forgive them. When that, you know, that, cruise, uh, that, uh, that uh, cruel thorns were left on his head, he said, Father, forgive them. When Fierce nails were pierced on his hands and legs. He said, Father, forgive them. When, his, when a big spear was put into his uh, uh, waist, again, he said, Father, forgive them. So they said continuously his prayer was, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. So I think the big message that came out is that we need to learn that essence of forgiveness from that message on the cross. His next one was, again, an absolutely amazing human uh, act. He calls John, he calls his mother, he calls his mother woman because he is now the, the God of all humanity. He's not just the son of uh, Mary, but he's also the God of all humanity. So he says, mother, he says, woman, here's your son. And he points to John. And to John, he says, he doesn't say woman. He says, John, this is your 
mother. There's a very interesting distinction, woman versus mother. There he is the Godhead. He is the God of all humanity. And to John, he now gives the responsibility of John taking over. And then, you know, it says John took care of her throughout because by then she was a widow and Jesus was supporting her in his human, you know, um, uh, system. But now he was going away. And so he gave that last responsibility of his sonhood. Even at the last minute, he had the conscious sensitivity to hand over the relationship of the sonhood to another responsible person like John, the apostle. And his fifth word was, I love this. It is finished. Your problems, it is finished on the cross. Your curses, it's finished on the cross. Your bondages, it's finished on the cross. Your challenges, everything is finished on the cross. In three words, he encapsulates the essence of all the challenges, of all the sins, of all the iniquities, and all the problems that mankind ever faced. And he said it, it is finished. He completed his mission. In other words, it's mission accomplished. It is finished. And then he gave, him, gave himself up in the father's hands. He says, Father, into thy hands I submit myself. He commits himself. And if you see there, this has been his constant prayer. Right from the time he came into the world till he left, he was under the authority of God the Father. He would always say, according to my Father's will. According to my Father's will. And at the final moment, he gave himself up into the hands of his Father. So he says, Father, into the hands I commit my spirit. And the last one is amazing. It's for all of us. So there are two other guys, two criminals who are laid, you know, who kept between the sinless God, you know, in between. One of them is cursing and taunting him. The other one wants to, you know, repent. So the repentant uh, sinner says, Lord, you know, I know I've been a sinner and you shouldn't be here, but if you can take me, I repent. And if I can be with you today, I would love it. And Christ in all his glory and all his beauty says, Today, you will be with me in paradise. So even for some of us who may have felt a little lost and distant from God, Christ is reminding us, even at the last minute, you still have that last semblances of hope that you can still get a new life, a new redemption, a new glory, a new grace, and a new call. So he says, today, you will be in paradise with me. So from this beautiful, you know, let's say I would say collage or mosaic of various things that happened. There are five critical messages that come out that I'd like to share with you this beautiful Saturday evening. Number one, the symbol of the cross is the perfect fulfillment of divinity. Divinity stands for love. Divinity stands for mercy. Divinity stands for compassion. Divinity stands for grace. And divinity stands for forgiveness. So when Christ was hung on that cross, he encapsulated the essence of these beautiful godly qualities. Love, empathy, forgiveness, mercy, grace, glory, all of that, the perfection of all of it encapsulated by Christ, you know, laying his body and his soul and his spirit on the cross of Calvary. And for all those guys, I again told you, for all of them who spat and cursed and beat him and persecuted him, he says, Father, forgive them. Six hours, continuous prayer of that. You know, that crown of thorns that were kept, there are supposed to be about 23 different types of thorns in, you know, in, the, in the surroundings of the Middle East. And the worst kind of thorn, you know, they call it the uh, crystal something, you know, biologically, that's the most painful, that's the sharpest thorn, and that was the thorn that was kept on our Lord's head. For what? For all the evil thoughts that we've been harboring in our heads. You know, the thought, as I keep telling you, it's the head that has, you know, which is the center of all our thoughts and emotions. And for all those evil thoughts that we had in our mind, you know, he bore that sin for us. You know, here is uh, an anecdote. So, uh, you know, we become so evil. 
Today, a few weeks back, America, the United States of America, which was born on the grounds of the Holy Word, was born because there was persecution in England and the Pilgrim Fathers who wanted to escape persecution from the Roman Catholic Church escaped and went as the Pilgrim Fathers on that ship called Plymouth and went and established his new Christian country based on Christian values, Christian doctrines and the Christian truth. A few weeks back, there was an announcement. Okay, uh, let me go back a little. In 1963, there was this woman. I don't know whether you know her. She's called the most hated woman in all of America. Anybody who knows who it is? The most hated woman of all of America? Anybody? Okay, so don't say Kamala Harris. Because yesterday when I asked this question in church, somebody said Kamala Harris. And I, I didn't know what to say. Uh, this lady is called uh, Madeleine Murray. And Madeleine Murray is, uh, is a diehard, was a diehard atheist and this lady i don't know what i think she was satanic there's no other explanation for it she was satanic she would use such uh, negative language when she speaks about christ and christianity and holiness and she filed a suit in the supreme court of the united states asking for a ban of prayer christian prayer in public schools and guess what that was the starting of the trouble for all of united states in 1963, the United States Supreme Court gave a ruling in favor of Madeleine Murray. And millions and millions of Americans were very hurt with that, uh, you know, with that uh, uh, judgment, which is why Madeleine Murray went on to become the most hated woman in all of America. Of course, she had a very, very uh, nasty, bad death. Okay, so what goes around comes around. What you sow is what you will reap. She had plenty of money. She had plenty of you know, stuff she was doing. She was very famous. But the last few weeks of her life were completely torturous. She was kidnapped by a few people along with her son and daughter-in-law. They were taken to a secret place. All her wealth was uh, uh, ripped apart from her. And then they strangled her, killed her. And then they you know, uh, completely annihilated her and her son and daughter-in-law. So it was a sad death for a person who never repented throughout her life. Now, this is one part. So when Christ had to go through this pain, he was reflecting that forgiveness, forgiveness even for a person like Madeleine Murray. And uh, this happened. So throughout history, we have a number of people who had been atheists, who had ridiculed God, who had condemned God. And then you have an army of people who raise up to tell them that the good news is still around. And as I said, in many scientific forums in universities, you have a huge army of uh, professors and scientists and researchers who are rising up to defend the faith and defend Christ and the gospel of grace and love. So that is happening. Now, you know, there's also this wonderful, uh, so when we say divinity, we, it needs to reflect, the cross reflects that divinity. When you rub uh, neem wood and if you try to taste it, it will taste bitter. You know, the aroma will also be bitter and the taste will be bitter. If you rub sandalwood, and if you, you know, taste it, if you smell it, you have the aroma of the sandalwood. And then if you rub the cross of Christ, you get the aroma of divinity, of love, of grace, of glory, of compassion, of mercy, of forgiveness. So that's the symbol of the cross, that it is the perfection of divinity in all of its entirety. So when uh, the first time this Russian guy is sent a guy on space, his name was uh, Nikolai. So Nikolai goes up in space and think he, you know, think he's somebody bigger than God. So he goes up on space and then looks down and says, now that man has conquered space, there's no God. Okay, he declares that from the rocket and everybody you know, gets uh, center news, center spread news across the world. Billy Graham was you know, a very powerful speaker at that time. So Billy Graham countered him by saying, you know what this looks like? This looks like a little worm inside the ground which lifts his ugly head up and sees around and says, there is nothing around and says, the earth is empty of any people. Okay, so it's exactly like that is what Billy Graham countered him. And then something remarkable happened. In the same America, you know, again, astronauts. So this is very interesting. Astronauts are very scientific people. They're supposed to, you know, worship physics and mathematics. But believe me, among astronauts, you have extremely strong believers. 
One of them was a guy called Edwin Buzz Aldrin. Some of you may know him. And Edwin Aldrin, Buzz Aldrin, wanted to actually have the Holy Communion in one of these space, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 space adventures. And uh, there were some technicalities. They said, could you break bread? You know, could you actually do it? You're not a master, you're not a priest. And then they had to send back some message asking, is it possible? And then thankfully, better sense prevailed and people said, you know, in the New Testament, New Church, you know, they never had any pastors, bishops and priests. All these were brought by man-made. You can break bread wherever. So this guy actually celebrated the Holy Communion right in the middle of nowhere, celebrating the honor of God. And you know that uh, the Psalm 23 was read uh, when uh, Apollo 11 went across. Then there was a microfilm of the Holy Bible, a few pa pages of the Holy Bible that were taken to uh, the moon and brought back. Uh, and then uh, the people were very excited about it. And in Apollo 14, they actually took 100 Bibles, 100 microfilm Bibles, not the Bible that you and I imagine, but microfilm Bibles, which were taken up and they read verses from that and brought back. So the message I'm trying to give you, divinity was reflected on the cross and divinity still is in the hearts and minds of people, including people from the scientific fraternity. That's why I'm using the example of astronauts to encourage all of us that if these guys can believe, I don't think it should be difficult for us to believe. The second big message that comes out from the cross is the glory of the forgiveness of sins. Prior to the cross, you know, the tradition, the ancient Hebraic tradition, and the ancient tradition in many other religions, including Hinduism, including other religions, was that you do a sin, you can repent for that sin by doing certain sacrifices. And Christ, as the ultimate atonement of all the sacrifices, went across, forgave entire humanity, and went on to be the ultimate symbol of sacrifice for our sins. So he became the forgiveness, the symbol of the forgiveness of sins for all of us. And when we say forgiveness for the sins, you know, sin is the world's worst poison. You know, if you see a passage in, um, in the New Testament, it talks about sin, lust begetting sin and sin begetting death. So the wages of sin is death, how it happens from our eyes, from our lust and lust giving birth to sin and sin then giving birth to death. Now, between the lust, the sin, and the death comes Christ, comes Christ, Christ's cross. And that cross is the division between death and condemnation and hell and eternity and heaven and all the inheritance that we have. You know, here's another interesting thing. When Christ died on the cross, not only did he forgive us, he also gave us blessings. We may not realize this, but there's a beautiful passage I want to uh, refer to. You know, if you have uh, your Bibles, you can take uh, Galatians uh, chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 12. And then we'll read from there, you know, 13 and 14. Okay. So verse 12 says, right, but that no man is justified, sorry, uh, and the law is not of faith. Wait, wait, sorry. Uh, Galatians 3. Yeah, right. 14. Sorry. 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, I want you to pause for a minute and go back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Christ, I mean, God Almighty, Yahweh, invited Abraham to look at the sky. And he said, count the number of stars. And we know it's an impossible thing, so it's infinite. And he said, that's the kind of blessings I'm going to give you. Then he also told them to look ground, look at the ground and say, count the number of sands, the grains of sands in the sea. Again, it's infinite. He couldn't count it. He said, I'm going to give you this. Now listen carefully. God blessed Abraham, both spiritually, which is the sky, the stars in the sky, and materially, which is the sands in the earth. Now listen carefully. So what's the big deal? What is in it for me? Now I'm continuing verse chapter three, verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham 
might come on the Gentiles. That Gentile is you, that Gentile is me, that Gentile is all of us who are not Jews through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. So there are two or three remarkable things that happen on that cross. One is the forgiveness of sins. When our sins are forgiven, we become inheritors. We become inheritors of what? We become inheritors of Abraham's blessings. And what are Abraham's blessings? Heavenly blessings and earthly blessings. So today, if you and I, that's why we say we are not a slave to fear because we are a child of God. We sing that song, right? It's a beautiful song. For I'm no longer a slave of fear, for I'm a child of God. When we sing that, we need to sing it with all pride and with all you know, authority because that's what he has given us. That is the real beauty of the cross. Not only did he die for our sins, not only did he die for our curses, not only did he die for our sicknesses, but he gave us a glorious blessing that he promised Abraham, right? All that. So that's why now you see, read that passage, you'll realize it, that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So he has redeemed us from the curse to give us the blessing. Whose blessing? The blessing of Abraham, which is both spiritual and material. So when we look at the cross, when we meditate on the cross, what we get is the glory of the blessings of Abraham. Just like how electricity lights up a light bulb, just like how magnets attract, you know, those steel uh, bits, so also the cross of Calvary shatters our sins, shatters our curses, and invites us to the glories and blessings of Abraham through Jesus Christ, right? So that's such an amazing revelation that we have that we can do that. In hundreds of faith, you have so many different ways by which they, you know, have to go, but they don't. Okay, you can do this, you can do that, you can, but they won't. For us, Christ died once and for all. He made the ultimate sacrifice, paid the ultimate price, and once and for all, he broke the shackles and then gave us the inheritance of Abraham. And that is so important for us. You know, the next reason, the third one is, as I've been saying, the symbol of the cross is the breaking of all curses and bondages. That's what we read. Because the law is about the curse. And when Christ redeemed us from that curse of the law, because it also said in that verse, being made a curse for us, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. He broke that curse for us. And you know, the Bible says sin will follow you. You see those, that's a, that's a very scary thing. Sin will follow you. So economic suffering, health problems, relationship issues, challenges that we face in the world could be because of a result of our sins. And it's the sin that has separated us from God Almighty, as we saw on uh, uh, Isaiah 59, verse 2, right? Now, here are some, you know, evil things that are happening in this world. Some of you may have read this. There is this rapper in the U.S. A few weeks back, he announced, this guy is a satanist. He's an openly, you know, uh, let's say, open uh, homosexual. And this guy has released a very evil song where the visuals are about he descending from heaven to hell. And he has now launched, he tried to launch rather, because it was now thankfully nullified by the US courts. He launched the Satan Shoes, okay, limited edition, 666 pairs. And uh, he had uh, Luke uh, chapter 15, 18 or 18, 15, which was put there, <coughs> which is, and I saw Satan, you know, strike, struck down from heaven to earth. And this fellow puts that. And the worst part is, it has one drop of human blood in each pair of shoes. And he was trying to sell it for $1,000 with the Nike swoosh. So people thought it was a Nike special edition. But thankfully, it was not Nike's. Otherwise, Nike would have closed shop. Uh, you know, the, the beauty, there were two things I learned from this. That there are stupid people in the world who still worship Satan. So we have to pray for little Nas. I think his name is Nas or whatever. I, I don't get these guys' names. 
okay some evil guy but we have to pray for him that god love him you know god loves even these guys even the satanist god loved because he died for these guys as well so they need to get this gospel of love the second most interesting thing i found was even in so called you know uh, liberated america there were millions of people who were up in arms who said how can and they started boycotting nike because the nike swoosh was there so thankfully nike filed a suit and said no 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 we have nothing to do with these shoes with these dirty shoes so we are not part of it and yesterday there was a ruling by the us court saying that you can't sell this you can't sell certain shoes so thank god better sense has prevailed but the big thing is that there are people here who do these uh, you know things very anti christ things which happen around us and we need to keep praying for them so that we can break these curses we can break these bondages so when uh, you know uh, the first curse of course happened when in the garden of eden when adam and eve refused god's wonderful commandments and wonderful promises and did something bad so that's the time when god cursed them and that curse was there till the cross of calvary so from the garden of eden till the cross of calvary the curses were there and then christ almighty broke those curses once and for all when he laid his body when he laid his you know when he spilled his blood for us so that these curses may be broken and the fourth one is our sicknesses are healed because of the cross the first is the perfection of divinity the second one is the symbol of forgiveness the third one is the breaking of bondages and curses the fourth one is all our sicknesses are healed the bible says by his stripes we are healed you know there's a very interesting calculation that he was flogged 39 times and of course historians biblical scholars have some very interesting interpretations of that they say there are 39 broad classifications of sicknesses across and christ died for every single sickness and i wanted to look at it from another way you know if you go to a doctor today for any kind of uh, you know a disease uh, you know in these days if you even go for a common cold you know if you sneeze if you cough the doctor is going to look at you skeptically but then he'll give you a set of medicines he'll give you a flu shot i'll give you an injection he'll give you some medicines and then the doctor will tell you something i've always been intrigued by that statement he'll say you know take this and if it doesn't get cured come back to me after a week okay now that's kind of strange this guy studied medical you know degrees for those of you studying medical degrees you got to be careful here you got an md you got an ms you got a 5 years plus a 2 to 3 years of house surgency then you got 2 to 3 years of uh, you know masters and now you come and give me something on a paper and then you say if this doesn't get cured come back after a week now let me cross uh, you know a uh, compare that with christ almighty so you have many people thousands of people with all kinds of diseases who came to christ they came with sicknesses they came with weaknesses they came with death they came with all kinds of problems christ would say you're healed and never did he ask them if you have a problem come back again okay they would once they are healed they healed forever he was the ultimate healer the ultimate doctor without going to any medical university or medical college so i think that's very significant and his ultimate act of crucifixion actually sealed all our sicknesses now here's some very interesting scientific facts this is from the institute of personal medicine oxford university the head of this particular center of personal medicine is a highly respected doctor and this guy he's not a christian okay he's not a christian he's not a religious guy but this guy has written a book called dr u and if you read the book dr u is all about where he validates that the biological system in the human body which you and i strongly believe has been wonderfully and fearfully made by god almighty he says has everything that you need to resist every disease on the planet are you with me you don't need anything you don't need medicine medicine is a big racket by the way okay now some of you studying medical school might get hurt if i say this but that's the reality it's a very unholy nexus between big pharma between the medical profession between university professors in biology in life sciences and medical sciences and the pharma industry and they cook up they do all kinds of uh, dirty stuff you can google this you'll find some scary stuff okay you don't need it god has created such a beautiful body with everything intact and we messed it up by you know putting chemicals and drugs and all that stuff so when god said that all your sicknesses are healed he really meant it 
in the Old Testament, you know, it says, I am the God that healeth thee, Jehovah Rapha, and by his stripes we are healed. So we need to take that and understand that God has healed us. God has given us complete health and wellness. In fact, rather than praying for sickness, maybe even our words should say, thank you for your wellness. He should give us wellness. Okay, for children of God, we should pray for wellness. So the fourth blessing that he gave us is he broke all the curses of sickness and gave us wellness. The last one is the reconciliation with the Father. So that cross, as I told you, is the, is the bridge between earth and heaven. Is the bridge between humanity and God Almighty. Is the bridge between sin and forgiveness. Is the bridge between hell and heaven. And Christ reconciled us once for, for all with God Almighty by his awesome sacrifice, allowing himself to be torn apart, he gave us the blessing of eternal life. And that is something that we need to understand. Colossians 1.20, it says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. I say, whether they be things in earth or things in in heaven. I want you to underline this passage. Think about it, folks. And having made peace through the blood of the cross, we're talking about Christ here. He makes peace with God Almighty through the blood in the cross by him, okay, by Christ to reconcile, to reconcile, okay, and this part we miss out. All things, not some things, all things, all the curses, all the bondages, all the iniquities, all the sins, everything negative, he has reconciled unto himself by him, whether they be things, again, see it validates, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So while we are here on this planet, God Almighty expects us to lead a holy, pleasing life to him because we are redeemed. We cannot be you know, filled with evil, lustful, sinful thoughts because he has already borne it through his crown of thrones. So we need to realize that. So when he reconciled us, it was a perfect reconciliation of all things. Colossians 1.20. Keep that in your system, in your mind, when you meditate on the cross. Reconciled once and for all, all things in heaven, all things on earth. Think about it. Think about it, Right? And as a result, that power of reconciliation. Today, you and I can boldly go to the mercy seat, to the throne of grace, where the second of glory is there straight away. And where is that? That's right inside us. We are the temple of the living God. So every day when we meditate, we meditate unto Yahweh, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit deep down inside each one of us. And we pray. And I want you to think about this. I don't know whether I shared this with you, but this might be very relevant here. So everything has been given to us. Our curses have been broken. Our sicknesses have been broken. Our bondages have been broken. Our sicknesses have been healed. He has reconciled us and he has given us the perfection of divinity in all his compassion and all his love, his forgiveness, his grace and his glory. Now, how are we supposed to live? And I have two things and I'll end with that. The first one is called the dash. The dash. The dash it's a very interesting, simple, but extremely profound phenomenon. I'm going to use me as an example. Brother Christopher, born 14th February 1959, right? So you all, thank you for celebrating my birthday, 14-02-1959. And at God's appointed time, I would have an end date in this planet. Each one of us would have an end date, but I'm using me as an example so that it's comfortable. Others may not feel hurt. I have an end date on this planet. I don't know when that is. It's God's appointed time. That appointed time, when he calls, I'm ready to go. So there's a start date. There's an end date. And then people put me inside a nice big black box. And probably there are condolences, there are cries, there are prayers, there are songs. And then you put me, and then there is an epitaph, as we call it, on my grace that says, Christopher Abraham, born, died 
died, right? Or born into this, entered into the world and then entered into God's glory. And then there's a dash in between. I want you to think about that dash. That dash is the period of time God Almighty allowed you and me to be in this world. And I want you to think, what would that dash signify for you? What would that dash signify for me? How many people did I hurt? How many people did I show my vengeance? How many people did I show my revenge? How many people did I pain? How many places did I sin? Or how many people did I love? How many people did I forgive? How many people did I influence? How many people did I impact? How many people did I make a difference on, right? How many people did I show compassion and mercy on? That's the dash. And that dash is extremely significant. And that dash can be filled with the meditation of the cross every single day. Lord, you suffered on the cross for my sins and I thank you for it and I want to be sinless. You suffered on the cross for me, for my curses and today I am blessed and I want to be a blessing to others. Lord, you suffered on the cross and broke my bondages. Today I am free and free indeed. I should share this message of freedom, of bondage breaking and love to every other person I see. Lord, you help me to understand the power of forgiveness, that you forgave all of us and forgave everybody who persecuted you. Help me to forgive everybody who persecuted and vilified. Right? That should be our prayer. That's the dash. The dash is the impact and the influence we have on this planet when we are alive. As Christians, as children of God, we have a special, special purpose that we have to fulfill. You remember we meditated many weeks on the purpose-driven life, on what God's purpose was in all of our lives, right? And I'll end with this beautiful story. This is a story, but it's a very powerful story to meditate on the cross. There's a story of the signal man who is, you know, this is a very traditional story. So in those days, they never had digital railway signals. So whenever a train used to pass, the signal man would have to pull the lever to send the train on a particular track. It was a night session, it was raining, it was dark, and the power was coming intermittently. There was a train that was rushing across, and by instinct, the experienced signal man knew that the train was arriving. So he puts his hand, both his hands on the lever, and with all his might and strength, pulls it to the other side. When he pulls it, some of you have seen it in our, uh, in our, in our places, that you know the, 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 the railway track would come together. So he, while he's doing that, both the tracks come together. And at the moment when both these tracks come together, there's a loud voice that comes, Papa, there's a sound that comes across. And he realizes his four-year-old son was playing near the tracks. And at the time of pulling that lever, his son's legs get caught in between those two iron rails. Now the signal man has a few seconds before he could do what he had to do. He could release the lever and save his son or leave the lever as it is and allow the train to pa pass so that hundreds of lives can be saved on that train. Because if he doesn't, if he pulls the lever, the train will get derailed and many lives could be lost. Within a few seconds, he had to take a decision. And as you would know, he took the painful decision of allowing the lever to stay there. So the train passes and the engine driver nor the passengers knew what had actually happened. The boy was crushed to death. And the father, of course, takes his mangled body after, you know, the train passes. And he sacrifices his only son so that many hundreds could be saved. Now, there are a number of powerful lessons in the story. The first one is, of course, you can liken it to God Almighty allowing his only begotten son to be dead, to be crucified, to be sacrificed on the gory cross of Calvary so that you and I may have an eternal life, so that you and I may have a life without sickness, so that you and I may have a life without bondages, so that you and I may have a life without curses, so that you and I may be a symbol of forgiveness, of love and compassion and mercy and grace and glory. 
but there's something else to it. When that railway signal man refused to you know, pull the lever and in the process saved those lives, it was but an accident because when he put that lever there, it was by accident that he gave his only son. But God Almighty, in his infinite wisdom, <coughs> before the beginning of time, had earmarked his only begotten son to be crucified, to be punished on the gory cross. So it wasn't an accident. It was a predetermined, predestined, divine order that had to be fulfilled on the cross of Calvary. So this evening, when we meditate on the cross, let us remember what an awesome plan, what an awesome sacrifice that Christ Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. And we need to rededicate ourselves on this day. Tomorrow, we're going to celebrate his resurrection. But it's not just one day that he you know, died and rose again on the third day. Every single day, the cross should be the centerpiece of our meditation. The cross should be the centerpiece of our glory to God Almighty. Let's bow down our heads for a minute and ask the Lord that he spoke to us so specially about the special message about the cross. Let's rededicate ourselves to the meditation of the cross, the power of the cross in all our lives, all the time. <laughs> oh, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Master, for teaching us from your powerful words. Lord, we understood new dimensions, new revelations about the power of the cross. Even before the beginning of time, you had predestined your son, your only begotten son, <coughs> to be sacrificed for us as the ultimate sacrifice. So that each one of us who have gathered here may enjoy the fruits of heaven. <coughs> may enjoy the fruits of eternity and blessings of eternal life. May enjoy the fruits of divine pardon and forgiveness. And share this gospel of love and compassion and forgiveness. That all our bondages have been broken in the name of Jesus. That all our curses have been broken in the name of Jesus. That all our sicknesses have been healed in the name of Jesus. And every single day, Lord, when we come up to your mercy throne, when we come up to the mercy throne of grace, help us to meditate on the awesome power of the cross. All those sufferings, all that pain, all that tribulation was for us to inherit the blessings of Abraham, both on this earth and in heaven. Or hereafter. Lord, we commit these wonderful children, wonderful brothers and sisters, brothers, sons and daughters, into your mighty hands, Lord. Thank you for your awesome sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And thank you for the glorious resurrection that has given us a new hope for us now and forevermore. We commit our youngsters into your hands. Let every thought, word, and deed be enslaved in your power in the power of your word. Let every one of them be filled with your Holy Spirit and let them walk the walk that is guided by your divine Holy Word. We ask all this in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.